Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NAGT webinar series. Before we begin, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and video cameras off. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. To access the chat box, find the Zoom control bar and click on chat. Webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring that for your questions and comments. Also, a reminder that participant, all participants in NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAG2 Code of Conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT Code of Conduct policy, which will be linked in the chat in just a moment. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in this series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NIGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen, there's a link to the webinar series where you can find the schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. There you can find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. Oh, good. Today's webinar is titled Science Communication for Social Justice, presented by Beth Bartel from Michigan Technological University and Wendy Bowen from IRIS. Beth and Wendy will share ideas for how to engage with diverse audiences, tips for amplifying the voices of diverse scientists, and how to develop educational materials explicitly created using a, a justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility lens. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Beth and Wendy, for participating in the webinar series. And with that, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. It is wonderful to see so many of you here joining us today. I apologize for any of my children that may be in and out. It is what it is, you know, we are scientists and parents and we have lots of different identities and we're gonna bring that uh, to our work today. So first, we want to just take a moment to introduce ourselves. My name is Wendy Bohan. I'm with the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. My pronouns are she, her, and I am presenting to you today from the Piscataway homeland. My name is Beth Bartel. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a science communication specialist, formerly at UNAVCO until recently, and now a PhD student at Michigan Tech, and I am, uh, I feel gratitude in being able to speak to you from the Keweenaw Bay tribal land, um, the homeland of the Ojibwa peoples. Uh, we want to start off um, by recognizing the work that has been done in this space. There is a lot of wonderful scholarship that has happened over many, many years uh, in the space of racism, DEI, and social justice, both in STEM and in society, and we want to recognize especially the work done of people of color, particularly women of color. We have not made an exhaustive list. These are some of the ones that have been an influence to us, so we want to recognize and acknowledge that work. We want to also recognize and acknowledge that we are white women, and we don't have the lived experience of a lot of the people that are attending today. So there are many people here today, and we're hoping that we can share knowledge and elevate knowledge to help all of us do better in this work. Uh, we also want to point out something super exciting that's happening. Uh, Black and Geoscience Week is going to be September 6th through 12th. Their uh, the hashtag is Black and Geoscience and their Twitter handle is uh, BLK and Geoscience. So these are their fantastic uh, logos. Uh, the logo behind me is also done by the same designer. So please join into that. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. So we want to ask you about your goals. Um, again, thank you for showing up. We wanna know why you're here, what you hope to get out of the webinar and how you hope to use it. So if you could just take a quick moment uh, to write your goals down in the chat box so we can get an idea of uh, what it is that you wanna do and what it is you wanna get out of this. So just take a quick moment to do that if you would. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's totally fine. If you're willing to share, it'll be helpful for us and other people on the call. Uh, it was helpful for us to see what people submitted through their registrations. Uh, that helped steer our content a bit. So anyone who's feeling bold or brave, takes a bit of courage, go ahead and share with us your goals. You see resources, go ahead. Strategies, resources, 
a better job in communicating about difficult topics. Yes, we have to give each other grace as we're learning in this space. Uh, curriculum planning, right? Creating inclusive materials and training courses that are inclusive. This is excellent. Hearing different perspectives. How to incorporate a Jedi lens. Yes, absolutely. Helping students feel more welcome in geoscience. Yes, we need to change the culture. Make sure everyone feels welcome, safe, and supported. Exposing students, great. These are wonderful. Keep, uh, please, entering these in there. Get to know each other. Get to know each other's goals. Our community is our backbone. Our community is what's important. And hopefully it's evident from this too that there is no way that we're going to be able to address all this in one hour, even though we are cramming in what we think is an amazing amount of material. We're going to try to talk fast <laughs> and, and uh, we apologize in advance for everything that we're going to send your way. And we will have this uh, presentation online. We'll give it to NAGT to post on the website along with the, the video. Yes. So uh, one of the tenets of good science communication that is that we make sure that we talk uh, to our audience in ways that are uh, respectful, reasonable, and understandable. So jargon is one of those things, right? Jargon is a big thing in science, and we want to make sure that we either eliminate jargon or define it. So we're going to go through some really important vocabulary. There's a lot of words that are talked about uh, in relation to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as social justice. So we want to make sure that we're all on the same page with some of these concepts. So starting off with science communication, this is the practice of informing, educating, sharing the wonder of science, raising awareness of science-related topics. We have a good idea of what it is, but we also need to consider a few other factors. When we think about science communication, we're usually thinking about the communicator, the person that's uh, giving the, the information. We think about the audience and who they might be. It's also por uh, important to consider the platform. So it's different to share science on social media than it is to share science in a classroom or to share science on a web page. So the platform is important and will help to guide what we share and how we share it. It's also important to remember that despite what all of these Zoom meetings might have us believe, good science communication has to be bi-directional, right? We can't just throw facts at people. We have to listen. Communication is fundamentally learning how to listen. And all of these things are happening within a social, emotional, and physical context. We have to meet people where they are. And so recognizing where people are and how we can best meet their needs and understand their needs is critical. So social justice. Social justice is justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a uh, society. And so we are going to ask you a question and try and do a word cloud uh, to determine where you think the inequities lie in science. So uh, let me uh, post this in the chat box to give you easy access. I think I've got it. Oh, so there's the website. Mine didn't. Ignore mine. And there's the numbers. So if you go to that website and you put in the numbers, Think of, so we're thinking about where the inequities lie in geoscience. Think of uh, one word at a time. It could be a description. It could be a, a person. It could be anything that you can think of where there are inequities in geoscience. And so then let me turn over uh, the screen to Beth so that we can show the word cloud. We're hoping this works, right? Interactivity. We're all learners. Mm -hmm. So if you can go to that Oh, do you have to register? You shouldn't have to register. You should not have to register. You should be oh, able to. Go. There we go. Great. So hopefully you can all see this, this word cloud forming in real time. Where do the inequities lie in geoscience? No wrong answers. Whatever you've seen, what you've experienced, what you've heard about. Um, a lot of this doesn't come from our experience. We have to learn about it. We have to, to see it. We have to listen to and believe the stories of others to see the inequities, especially if we're personally in a place of, of privilege within geoscience. So this is, this is great. Access is coming up big. So for those of you not familiar with word clouds, the, the words, the largest words should be the words that are coming up most frequently. So access, field work, safety, opportunities, power, representation, this is like such great groundwork for representation. <laughs> um, race, promotion. Wendy, what are you pulling out from this? 
opportunities, inclusion, and we have all sorts of, of different things. We're, we're pulling out features of people, ageism, things about race. We're also pulling out things about access and opportunity, uh, languages, microaggressions, inclusion. So this is, this is excellent. I see exposure, tenure, you know, some things that are, that are systemic part of the system. What's the tenure system? What about funding? Um, other things that are possibly more subtle, like visibility and access, like we said. Great. All right. So, Keep adding to this and we'll share this uh, once the presentation is, is done to see what the, the total word cloud ended up being. I'm going to share my screen again. Great. Find it. Okay. All right. Oop, on to the next. So some more uh, terms. Uh, we hear a lot about equality, equity, justice. What's the difference between these words? So this is just a very simple cartoon where three different people are trying to watch a soccer game. The first uh, left column is about equality. And this is the assumption that everyone is benefiting from the same support. So in this case, all people get a box. And the idea is that this is equal treatment. And yet the person that's tall can now see the game really well and the smallest person still can't see the game. So we can improve that. And when we improve that by giving everyone the supports they need, that produces equity. But we can go a step further than that. We can go towards justice, which is taking away the cause of the inequity itself. So removing that systemic barrier. So now we have a fence that people can see through. Now, if we remove that fence, that would actually be more like liberation. So there's different stages of things we can do. We want to be aiming for justice and liberation, taking away the barriers that are holding people back. Another important idea is intersectionality. So this was introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw 30 years ago. She was a critical race scholar, among many other things. And it describes how race, class, gender, and other uh, intersecting characteristics of people overlap. The important thing is that this acknowledges that human beings are complex and that they can't just be defined by one identity. Uh, additionally, these different identities will have different oppressions depending on the situation and the location. And not every individual is going to identify with each one of these uh, different traits. They'll think about themselves and these traits in different ways. Implicit and explicit bias. So bias itself is our prejudices that we have towards people or groups. Explicit biases are attitudes or beliefs that we hold on a conscious level. We're aware of them. Um, and the actions that we take with explicit bias have intent. Implicit bias is unconscious attitudes that lie below the surface, but they influence our behavior. Implicit bias is really, really difficult because how are you supposed to address something that's unconscious that you don't recognize? So this is where a lot of the work needs to be done personally. And if you're interested in doing that, which it would be a great thing to try, you can do implicit bias tests online for free. It's called Project Implicit. Man, I took these and it really opened my eyes, particularly about the gender roles. I think I'm very progressive. We have an equal-ish distribution of work in my house, but I have very traditional gender roles. So implicit bias is something that we can all confront. We all have them. We all need to work on this. So next is microaggressions. Microaggressions are common. They happen every day. They're usually done unintentionally, but they're verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities. And they are uh, negatively prejudicial, and they're insulting towards a group, particularly towards culturally marginalized groups. And the problem here is that these small differences in treatment really pile up, resulting in large disparities. You can think about it like death by a thousand cuts, right? And it's it's very um, difficult because they're so frequent. They happen all the time. And those who differ from the norm encounter this uh, cumulative disadvantage through time, whereas those who fit the norm experience a cycle of advantage. So these things through time really do make quite a difference. Now, harassment. We all hopefully know what harassment is at this point, but it is uh, so prevalent in STEM, we wanna cover it uh, explicitly one more time. It's behavior which has the effect of humiliating, intimidating, or coercing someone through a personal attack. It causes the recipient to feel embarrassed, uncomfortable, causes them distress. And it's behaviors that are unwelcome, unwanted, and unsolicited, which the recipient regards as offensive or undesirable. When a person communicates that that behavior is unwelcome, then that's when harassment becomes illegal. 
and we've heard a lot about sexual harassment because of the Me Too movement, but there are lots of different kinds of harassment, including racial harassment. So people of color deal with racial harassment and women of color deal with both racial harassment and gender-based harassment, which is called a double bind. So harassment, discrimination, explicit and implicit bias don't just affect gender and race. They um, include homophobia and transphobia and um, the discrimination of people with disabilities. So all of these behaviors can be very problematic. We really want to just state outright that we all need to acknowledge that institutional discrimination is built into the foundation of science and society. It, it just is. We need to change it. So how does this manifest itself? Colonialist and Eurocentric educational practices, the knowledge that we choose to elevate, the people that we choose to talk about, and um, all of the, the ways that our syllabuses uphold this idea of whiteness as having the, the basis of knowledge. Dominant gender and social norms are problematic. Unequal pay for equal work, inadequate family leave policies, inflexible work schedules, workplace harassment, all of these things and more create a culture of exclusion. And that culture of exclusion is uh, very clear when you start to look at the statistics. So 49% of the STEM workforce are white men, 18% of the STEM workforce are white women, only 2% of the STEM workforce are Black and Hispanic women. In the classroom, women of color have their authority and competency challenged. They have their expertise discredited. Biases against people who identify as gay, bisexual, or transgender are particularly strong in STEM environments compared to other occupational fields. Now, focusing on geoscience, only 10% of geoscience PhDs go to recipients of color. Only 69 Black women and 20 Indigenous women have received PhDs in the geosciences in the last 40 years. Women, people from sexual and gender minorities, and Black and Hispanic people all leave the field of geoscience at higher rates than the average student or practitioner. This has to change. We can't stay the same. So some of the things we're going to talk about today are ways that we can start to implement this change. And the hope is that these individual things that we can do, these small steps forward, will help to make people feel more safe and included, but that will also help to really change the culture of science because we need to work on our retention. All right, we're gonna do another uh, word cloud here. And what we want you, oh no. <laughs> no, you didn't see that, you didn't see that part. <laughs> what we want you to do let me put this in the chat box again, is to describe, where is the chat box? There it is, a sort of a stereotypical geoscientist. And again, um, use one word, you can put in multiple words, but put them in at the time. So describe the, the stereotypical geoscientist. And Beth, if you start sharing your screen so we can see the word cloud. Yep. Give me just a second. This is very interesting, which is a, just a big teaser, right? Keeping so us interesting. In Bet you want to see it. Okay. Stereotypical geoscientist. Who is it? Beard, white, male, outdoorsy, physically active, fit, white guy, loud, drunk, loves Michael, beer. Hammer. Socks and sandals. Oh yeah. We have lab coat, older. Outdoorsy, coming out on top. Mm -hmm. Able-bodied, confident. Cowboy hat. Hammer holding crude jokes I saw in there. <laughs> Love camping. Flannel shirt, plaid shirt. Lab coat, dirty. So as we're compiling these, don't, don't write this in, in there, maybe write in the chat box, uh, who's missing from this picture? What traits are missing? What type of people are missing? Great, so we have some stuff coming in. 
Wendy, can you read some of that out? I have a question. Women, anyone not white, young, non-cis male, non-field, people of color, women of color, non-English speaking, non-field based, right, urban people, character traits, good communicators, people with disabilities. Yes. So here is what we wrote down which is amazing because it coincides almost exactly with many of the things you wrote down. White, male, outdoorsy, fit, rock hammer wielding, rock holding, uh, sexual orientation. We could make some assumptions about that. We could make assumptions about his interests, beer, bad jokes, flannel, Patagonia maybe, religion. And I want to, I want to throw in a note on ambiguity. So we don't know his sexual orientation. We don't know his interests. We don't know his religion. So on the upside, we can fill in whatever we want. We can make him whatever we want. And on the downside, we can make him whatever we assume him to be. So it doesn't challenge our assumptions. We can automatically fill in the blanks. So when I look at him, I'm going to fill in the blank. And if I were asked, you know, what do you think in your head, what did your head fill in there? I would say, oh yeah, he probably likes beer. He likes field work. He, well, that's part of the image, but he's a, you know, probably cisgender, uh, straight male, and uh, you know, probably atheist. So there's nothing there to challenge those assumptions that my mind fills in. And <laughs> efforts are are being made, and we want to acknowledge that efforts are being made within the geosciences to change these perceptions and to challenge these perceptions and challenge the stereotype visually, and. Next slide. A lot of these, a lot of these efforts really only address one of these factors that a geoscientist is male. So next slide. Um, we need to not just alter the mold. We need to break it. We need to just break the mold completely. And I'd say start from scratch. Unfortunately, we can't start from scratch because we're, we already have a starting point. So we have to work even harder to change these images or to create a new image of geoscientists. So we need to think about challenging stereotypes around all these factors, race and ethnicity, gender identity, style. Do geoscientists wear lipstick and heels? Absolutely, if they want to. Um, and we need to you know, not shame people for it and celebrate that and also present that. Um, body type and physical ability, tools, field. Does everybody study rocks? No. Does everybody even want to go out in the field? No. A sexual orientation, our interest and our religion, our age. Next. Oh, and actually I want to comment on this advertising um, quote. So this is about advertising, but anytime we're communicating, especially visually, um, it's essentially the same as, as advertising. It's who we say we are. And advertising impacts values. It reflects societal values, but it also has the effect of normalizing values or behaviors. So we need to ask, what do we want to normalize within geosciences? Go ahead. So we need to get really specific and be intentional with the imagery we choose. We need to center people of color, people with disabilities, people representing intersectionality, and other people who are underrepresented in the geoscientist visually. And show these demographics not only as listeners and receivers of information and opportunities, but in leadership roles, creating opportunities, doing amazing science, and you know, really pushing, pushing our scientific envelope in their own right. Um, we also need to change geoscience culture in our science communication by promoting an inclusive culture without assumptions of preferred behaviors or perspectives. So it's, you know, we've had the luxury, I think, for a lot, long time of having this very specific idea of what a geoscientist is and who a geoscientist is. And that's something that uh, resonated with me in undergrad, even though I didn't drink beer. Um, these things can be really, these assumptions can be really off-putting to people, people who don't drink beer and who have different religious backgrounds, who don't want to camp. Um, so we need to catch ourselves when we're making these assumptions and even making jokes and talking about, well, all geologists like beer and have events where it's focused around drinking beer and not all geologists do. And we want to create a more diverse workforce. And we want to expand the view of what geoscience is by presenting all aspects of geoscience. Again, it's not just field work. A lot of us love the field work. And most of science really, if we're being honest, is around computers. And we can do amazing geoscience without ever going out in the field. And for a lot of people from minority backgrounds, they and, and their families don't see field work as a valuable 
pursuit. So we need to show the full breadth of what we do in geoscience so we can get all the best minds in and be completely selfish about getting the best brains in. Additionally, there's been a lot of talk recently, and it's late coming, about safety issues surrounding going out into the field in particular places for different people, for women, uh, for racial minorities. It's, it can be very dangerous, and people need to take those concerns seriously. And there's been a lot of pushback about this idea, particularly at some of the larger universities, that there shouldn't be such a concentration on field and all of the things that we put out um, as advertising are usually field-based. So, you know, I think we really need to push back hard against this, this idea. So we put together a few check checklists for you all. This is just kind of a checkpoint. It goes over what we just talked about. Again, this presentation will be available and we'll also put together a PDF of resources for you at the end, including some stuff that we don't talk about. Representation, when you're creating materials for your department or making banners for a meeting, um, whatever visually you're doing, uh, ask, can we better represent a diversity of geoscientists, of geoscience as a whole? Are we representing people of color in leadership roles? So what, you know, what does this look like? Also in our classroom, I pulled this tweet. I know it's going to be hard to see, but this is a professor saying that she is going to use all visuals with, uh, with Black people throughout her courses this semester. So accessibility and inclusion. This is part of this is part of justice. So somebody mentioned JEDI. There's also IDEA. What do these acronyms mean? Well, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And when we talk about diversity, it's who is there. And when we talk about inclusion, it's what power do those people have? And who is welcome in that space? And several of you said you wanted to work on creating more inclusive spaces. So we can do that with our word choices, for example. So instead of saying you, as scientists, I can say we as scientists. So any time that I am part of that group, I can say we, and that's more inclusive. Um, gendered pronouns, he or she. Instead of he or she, we can say they, and then that's completely inclusive to all gender identities. Uh, gendered words like manned or man-made. All of those words, I can pretty much guarantee you, throw any word at me and I will come up with an alternative for you that's not gendered. We can use crude, staffed, human-made. Um, we can center a person instead of their characteristics. So instead of disabled person, we can say a person with a disability. And that acknowledges that first and foremost, they're a human being. People of color. If we're talking about black people, we can be specific and talk about black people. If we're talking about indigenous people, we talk about indigenous people. And there are times when we'll be you know, talking about that very broad demographic, but we can be as specific as possible. Language is also tricky and is evolving. So words like Black, African American, what's the preference? So with Black, we are now, we're capitalizing Black. So that's considered a best practice. Many people prefer Black to African American. Latino, Latina, many people now prefer Latinx to be, uh, to be gender inclusive. Um, and some people feel very strongly, people from these demographics also feel very strongly about being referred to as Latino or Latina and find pride in that. So this is where we need to do a bunch of listening and, and reflect back what a person tells us is, is the way that they are seeing themselves and want to refer to their parts of their identities. Uh, Self-awareness, here's another way to build inclusion, speak with humility and speak with pride. We don't always need to be humble, especially if we're speaking from a place of, of an identity that's underrepresented. Absolutely, we can speak with pride recognize our biases to counter them. So go do that quiz that Wendy talked about and, and then do the work, the follow-on work to identify where those biases come up for us and how they affect our behavior. So we can then catch ourselves and check ourselves and change that behavior. And then also we can explore a concept before negating it. So for example, uh, we may think that we know all about science and scientists and that science is a meritocracy and that science is objective by nature, that's what science is. And if somebody comes and tells us otherwise, we may feel a lot of pushback uh, against that. Before we push back, we need to check ourselves and listen. Uh, why is that person saying this? Are they talking about indigenous forms of knowledge? And I need to go explore that before I make a counter argument. Beth, really quickly, can I interrupt? There yeah. is a question in a chat that I wanna make sure we don't miss. Okay. Um, Erica asked, how do you avoid tokenizing people uh, in these advertisements? 
Uh, yes, so that is a great question and I would love some group think on that. So please go ahead and put your answers in the chat if you have thoughts on that. Um, I think we, we need to be authentic and sincere and, um, and you know, center people who, who we have worked with directly and not use the same images over and over. And this can be hard because as we have just seen, there's an amazing dearth of scientists of color within the geosciences. Wendy, do you have other thoughts on that? I struggle with this too, because we, when we think about this, we, we talk a lot about showing the workforce we want rather than the workforce we have. And it often comes off as disingenuous and makes people feel that it's maybe a more diverse department than the um, literature and advertisements are showing. And I think that that, that is disingenuous. I think, um, I think it's really difficult. So if people have ideas around that, like I feel like I have a better feeling for that if we're talking about things like people on the board. You know, if you're looking, how do you keep people from being tokenized for having to do too much DEI work and having that expertise and lived experience taken advantage of. And you know, that's, that's paying people, that's looking around the table and figuring out exactly who is there and who is not represented, what voices are needed there, and then recognizing their expertise, paying them for that expertise. It's harder when you're doing a visual representation. And so I think being explicit, if you're giving a talk or have a teaching a class where you can actually explain the images to people, I think that's helpful. But you know, anything that people are saying, we need to be honest. Sometimes you need to project the world as you would like it to be. Uh, posting statistics on department diversity clearly would make that transparent. Absolutely. Transparency is, is critical. Um, and I'm sorry. Right. Well, and I was going to say, and also we can, um, we can ask permission in some cases. So like this, um, you know, quiero ser geoscientifico, that, that middle flyer right there, you know, that was, um, that was specifically about diversity and I asked each of those people, you know, I didn't say I want to make a diversity flyer, but I, I told them what the product was and asked and actually I think uh, Jose might be on this call right now and asked, you know, can I can I feature you and one thing that I that came up in a um, a uh, workshop I was in this weekend was asking three questions. Does it benefit the individual? Does it benefit the institution? And I can't remember what the third one was. Um, and I think that that does it benefit the individual is really important. So um, are we raising the visibility of this person, um, not just tokenizing this person? And I mean, I think it's, I think it's tricky. So much of this is tricky, um, but I do, yeah. Marissa said the same thing, amplifying the person and not just the race is beneficial. We need to recognize the amazing scholarship that these people are, are doing and putting into the world, not just the fact that they may not fit the, uh, the overrepresented demographic, right? Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna cruise on, but keep, those, um, keep those, those questions coming. We might leave some for the end, but um, you guys can, yeah, we'll try to keep track of them. Um, so accessibility is part of, it's not part of the JEDI acronym, but it is part of IDEA acronym. Um, the A is for accessibility, and that came up in your, the word cloud as well. How can we make science more accessible? And that is, that's part of justice, is accessible information. So what about language? Can we translate our materials? Oops, <laughs> I was trying to advance the slide. Um, whether it's a video or in print. Visuals, there are more than 300 million people worldwide who are colorblind. How can we make visuals that are colorblind friendly for people? And there are a lot of online tools to address this. And also within Adobe, Adobe actually has a way to check your graphic to see how visible it is, uh, how colorblind blind friendly it is. Um, so that's something we can do. We can use alt text for images next. So what's alt text? Alt text is text that describes an image. So uh, LinkedIn and Twitter have both in, uh, incorporated this function recently, so kudos to them. You will now see if you upload an image to LinkedIn that there is an option to add alt text. And that means you can add, if you look in the middle there, you can add a little bit of text about what that image is, a brief description, and then people who are using screen readers can access that content. They know what that image is about. Uh, next, and then same with Twitter, it's add description. You can add a short description. And again, that is so people who have visual um, impairments can access your content. Next. 
What about audio? We can provide closed captioning. Uh, think about translated closed captioning as well. We can provide a sign language interpreter if we have the resources and it's appropriate, and we can use a mic. I think we've probably all been in a room or been the person in the room, I know I have, who says, oh no, I don't need a mic, I'll just speak loudly. Well, this can be challenging for a person across the room who has an, a hearing impairment and is not going to speak up in a meeting setting to ask that you use a mic. So if we all use a mic, then we're all on equal ground. So use a mic or have one available next. And here's our checklist. I won't go over all the things, but a couple of things that I didn't go over. Um, starting with, is the language sufficiently simple to be understood by our target audiences? Let's not make things harder than they need to be. Um, are we using references that are cultural, like baseball references? A lot of people like sports references. Well, if people don't know the game of baseball, they're not gonna get the reference. And maybe even more off-putting, if somebody doesn't have the resources to ski and somebody's talking about skiing, you know, skiing takes a lot of resources. So that can actually be a class, a classist issue. Um, and then um, can we make the test or font larger? I have to call this out because as I was writing that, Wendy was actually, she laughed because she was actually making the text smaller so we could fit more on our screen. Go ahead, next. So social media, uh, there's a lot that can be done and there's a lot of conversation on social media that's happening around issues of justice, equity, uh, diversity and inclusion. And there's a lot that we can do on social media to challenge assumptions. So we can challenge the perception of science and that's just, so important right now. This is a tweet from yesterday. Uh, my concern is we keep making this up as we go along. The government needs to get a grip on our scientists. How can the science change from one day to the next? Which shows a fundamental misunderstanding about science, that science is a process, not a set of facts. So if we can uh, show people the ideas, the challenges, the observations, the discoveries, the null results, all of these things that we experience on a daily basis that we recognize as part of the process, we can change what people see as science and the outcomes and the expectations from science. Importantly, and we've been talking about this, we can change the representation of scientists. So we can show the wonderful diversity of science, not all older men in white lab coats, right? And uh, social media is a really great way to get visibility. So uh, particularly on Twitter, but also on other things like Instagram and Facebook, uh, we have things where uh, there are communities that have organized, organized around hashtags, things like Black and STEM, Vanguard and STEM, Girls Who Code, Disabled and STEM, Latina and STEM, Buy and Sci. There's also organizations that do a lot of outreach on social media, like 500 Queer Scientists, 500 Women Scientists, Black and STEM, Geo Latinas, SACNIS. And then there's all of these initiatives that happen that are so exciting. You know, I have found so many amazing people that I can follow just by following these different hashtags and initiatives like hashtag this is what a scientist looks like or day of science or what's coming up in September black and geoscience. So this is an opportunity for us to expand the people that we follow, learn more about different sciences and show everything that's happening within our field broadly. Now importantly, social media allows us to cultivate communities of support. So research has shown that it provides connection, community, mentoring, sponsorship, and advocacy. It's a low cost, low barrier engagement tool. Three quarters of the world has social media. Uh, it can increase structural diversity and representation, promote and bring awareness to intersectionality, reduce feelings of isolation for minority scientists, and promote an increased sense of belonging and cultural wealth. And I really love this quote uh, from Montgomery in her 2018 paper. People are using these digital spaces to intentionally cultivate communities to support the success of individuals underrepresented in particular spaces and in the academy as a whole. So social media really gives us a chance uh, to elevate different people's voices and perspectives and to give people a platform that they've never had in academic and scientific spaces. All right, so here's the call to action. These are the actionable items. So, and keep those comments coming. And especially we see some from personal experience. Those are of course the ones that we listen to the most and that's a great lead in because what we need to do is educate ourselves first and foremost. Before we speak, we need to educate ourselves. And the less intersectionality we have, the more education we may need. So Wendy and I as white, cisgendered, straight women need a lot of education. There's a lot to learn. And there are a lot of books out there. There are peer reviewed, 
pieces in journals and opinion pieces in journals. Um, social media is an amazing place to self-educate. For example, Black in the Ivory was a thread, is a thread, a hashtag all about the experience of Black people in academia. Uh, just one from a couple days ago or just yesterday, uh, Black in the Ivory is having a candidacy candidacy exam in two days and carefully avoiding looking up any details about the Jacob Blake story because you can't afford to be derailed. So this helps those of us who are not Black understand the experience of Black people in academia. Um, and it also, for people who are of this demographic, so in this case for Black people, this is a uh, Black scientist, this is an opportunity to, to share experiences and also to, you know, find um, excuse me, find community to see who else is out there and, and what they have to say. And so this is where we need to listen. We've mentioned that a couple times already and listening is incredibly important. Uh, we can start a movement, join a movement, amplify a movement and or fund a movement. So uh, Wendy already went through some of these. There were a lot of movements and organizations that were active before the murder of George Floyd and more have sprung up after that. We've highlighted the ones that are specific to geoscience. Some of these are general STEM. Uh, if you're on social media, we recommend following the, all these groups. Um, and some of them are groups rather than movements like SACNIS, um, the society uh, that, uh, now I'm gonna get this wrong now that I'm thinking of Wendy. Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Whew. So there are groups that have done a lot of this work already and that we can learn from uh, next. And sometimes centering certain voices means not adding our own. So when we want to join or amplify a movement, if we're not of the demographic, uh, we're not that, that target audience or that, that target for the, uh, for the movement, um, we need to listen to people who are leading it. And if they ask allies to take a step back, we need to take a step back. Next, and this is again where where listening is really important. Go ahead, next. Um, that you know, how do we know? Well, we need to listen. And another thing we can do is call out injustices as we see them, and we can all share the burden in this, regardless of whether we are the target of the injustice. So people who are frequently the targets of injustice get really, really, really tired. And so uh, even people who are not of those demographics can step up, whether it's on social media or in a boardroom it, with our department as they're putting together a brochure, rather than having that one scientist of color having to be the person who speaks up, we can take that burden and we can speak up on behalf of ourselves. And, and there's a lot of room in which we can do this work. Next. So um, not to interrupt, but there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat box about uh, retweeting different posts. And it seems that some people can't uh, retweet. It's a, um, Kind of a conversation about when to retweet, when not to retweet, when to amplify, when not to amplify. And sure. in general, if there's ever a question, always check with the person before you share them. There's been a lot of uh, everything everybody's saying, I think is absolutely true. Thank you for sharing your expertise um, in these areas. A lot of times if people are talking about someone that has harassed them or that is having bad behavior online or offline, they won't tag them because they don't want to be the target of their harassment or if it's a really large account to be the target of the trolls that will come after them. So definitely don't start tagging in other people that could, that could cause that to happen. There's a, a lot of online etiquette about kind of how to protect people in those spaces. So thank you for all of the points in the chat box and, and keep that going. Sorry. Mitchell, are we gonna be able to capture this chat? Yes, we can. Great, that would be fantastic because I want to be able to read every single thing because I know that I have a lot to learn. Um, we can make a statement. So as, a, as an organization, I know this came up in, in a question. Um, as an organization especially, we can make a statement. So I think somebody brought up in the chat already, silence is violence. And when we make a statement, we need to be careful to make sure it's authentic, thoughtful, direct, aware, and also specific and actionable. And this is where those of us who are communicators or thinking about communication can also push a policy agenda because we can push for those that communication to be specific and actionable, which means we all have to do the thinking behind the actions that we're gonna take. Um, next. 
And if we can't make a statement, we can still make a statement. So the organizations that Wendy and I were a part of in May were not ready to put out a statement yet on Black Lives Matter, and we were not comfortable with our organizations being silent either. So we posted articles about the importance of diversity and inclusion and justice in geoscience. And we also centered people of color, particularly Black scientists, in our social media posts. Um, so we still could be saying something and adding to the conversation. And we can do this in all sorts of spaces, social media, classrooms, boardrooms, chat rooms, all of the above. And we can teach the history. A few of you said you wanted to incorporate social justice into your, into your classrooms. So we can get real about teaching the history of geoscience and teaching the colonial history of geoscience. We can teach about the inequities and harm caused by environmental damage. Um, and not only can we teach about these inequities and how environmental issues are exacerbated for people of color, minor, other minoritized communities, we can also feature the work of minoritized scientists in addressing these, these issues and doing fantastic science uh, like climate science. There's some really good resources that exist around decolonizing um, your your schedule and your your teaching. So I, we will share some of those resources um, in a, a document hopefully soon. And we need to own up to our mistakes. Wendy and I have both made a lot of mistakes, and we've been or at least some mistakes, and we've been called out for them. And it is really uncomfortable to be called out. And it is really easy to be defensive. And it took me a long time to realize where I was being defensive, why I was being defensive, because my intent is good. And it took me reading and hearing multiple times that defensiveness is a white trait. And then I finally got it. And we need to check ourselves when we feel defensive and come back to a place of humility. This is where we need to listen. We don't need to argue about our, our intent. We need to listen, hear, internalize that and then get ourselves get up brush ourselves off and go back to do the work because there's a lot more work to be done we also should thank the people that call us out it can be difficult for them to do that um, so making sure that we acknowledge the work that they've done to help educate us and make us better um, in in the work that we do so it's important to recognize that impact is always more important than intention always so um, I guess the, the point of all of this is we can't do it alone. And what we're talking about with science communication, this isn't the solution, but it's part of the solution. We can all do better. We can all work to change the culture in all of the spaces where we have any kind of power and influence. And every time that we communicate about science, we have a real opportunity to challenge the pre-existing beliefs within our culture, within society, and work towards greater equity and justice in science and in society, because you know science touches the lives of everyone. It's foundational, and so if we can help to change science, we can really help to make society better. So a few additional reminders: uh, Black and Geoscience Week is coming up September 6th through 12th. Black and SciCon Week is October 4th through 10th, and there is this wonderful group called Reclaiming STEM. Uh, Beth knows more about it than I do. It's a diverse and inclusive SciCom uh, workshops on both coasts that are created by these wonderful scientists that empower scientists to use STEM for social justice. So excellent work that they're doing. If you're on social media, please follow them. Please support their work. Let's all learn from them. Um, thank you all for please coming. Please and please. Lots of questions and stuff now. We can have discussions. We can, we have time. We built in time. Yeah, never enough, but yes. So we'd love to open the floor again. Thank you for showing up. And um, we'd love to open the floor up to questions and, so many of you. and comments. Yeah, so many of you have so much um, experience in this space and different lived experiences than we do. We wanna learn from you. Uh, we appreciate your, your comments and sharing your knowledge with us in the, the chat already. So keep doing, keep doing that. Um, Again, this is a resource page that we're going to put together to share. I'll stop talking. Why am I talking? <laughs> I was going to say, and also if there's something that, again, if there's something we said that you disagree with, please, if you're willing, let us know either here for everyone or let us know individually if you're comfortable with that. Um, we are, are constantly, constantly learning. Um, and unless people have questions, I know there's some questions that came through that I didn't quite get so um remind us 
if you have questions, comments. Has anyone incorporated a personal statement into their class material? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Information about who they are and what they stand for, that would be amazing. And you can unmute yourself. So if you want to talk rather than chat, we welcome that. Uh, recommendations for talking to people with more power than you have that have not shown an interest in promoting um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Right. So um, there's power in numbers. If you can find other people uh, that believe strongly about this also, and hopefully there's more than just one in your department or your organization, talking to them, putting together um, presentations. I'm happy to give you any of the material that we have. Scientists usually uh, like having uh, research papers referenced. So if you can reference enough literature, then they're like, oh, okay, you're making a point. I'm not sure how it would work uh, like in a, in a school system, but hopefully putting together materials to help convince people of why it's important. It's very frustrating to have to convince people about why people's dignity and safety is important, but here we are. Um, and uh, Joanna, if you're willing to, to tell us a little bit about that personal statement, uh, no pressure, but I'd love to welcome you to unmute yourself and share. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so I just have a personal statement that I wrote about my approach to inclusion and diversity in the classroom. Um, essentially just, you know, a statement saying that I want to make my classroom welcoming, um, that I'm still learning about inclusion and diversity. If something happens either by me or by, or something else in the classroom that, that, um, is damaging or uncomfortable or, you know, not right, that there are a number of ways that, uh, that a student could bring it to my attention, um, whether that's talking to me directly or going through somebody else that they feel comfortable with. Um, so just, you know, a personal statement that says, this is how I'd really like my classroom to be. This is what I'm doing to work on it. And, uh, you know, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and, and not a, not a corporate college statement because those can be, I don't know, they can be a little bit stiff or they can kind of appear that, that it's just a, you know, a policy statement. So this is just a, just a little thing that I wrote to say, this is how I want my classroom to be. I want you to be comfortable. I want you all to feel included. Um, and if I get it wrong, let me know because I want to improve that, um, the classroom for everybody. Right. So I see. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joanna. Um, so I see um, Shelby. Thank you for for pointing this out and posting this. One thing I just get discouraged about with in these discussions is that the accessibility discussion always centers around alt text, vision deficiencies, and captioning. Physical disabilities are almost always left out in the geoscience talks. So um, I focused on. Uh, those aspects because uh, I was thinking of communication and I was thinking more of, you know, like communication that's right in front of us. And absolutely, we need to do a lot of work around accessibility um, for physical accessibility uh, as well. And there are, um, there's a growing movement, there's uh, increasing education and knowledge around how to make field experiences uh, more accessible and also making our spaces accessible. Do we have ramps to our classrooms? Um, and if you want to, Shelby, if you want to jump in at any point and and share with us what you would like to see more of, I would, I absolutely welcome you to, to unmic and do that. Well, one thing that I find with the um, even talking about communication, again, if the student can't get to the classroom or can't access the space, you're, you're no longer communicating with them. The only thing you're communicating is that they're not important. Um, it's the same with field work. Geology often centers around field work. Um, even if we're champion, championing ideas to have something that's less field based, um, these students can't access that space. Anything with laboratory research, most labs are not accessible either. So again, communicating, it, it's, it's still important to be able to get students into these spaces and tell them that they, that they can access them and that they're important. Um, just making things available for, you know, alt text or captioning isn't enough to communicate with students who can't physically get there. 
Absolutely. So I'm going to post, um, find them on social media. Uh, so um, for those of you who aren't familiar with IAGD, the International Association for Geoscience Diversity, um, they are fantastic wealth of knowledge in this realm and uh, you can become a member, I believe still for free. They're on social media, um, both on Facebook and on Twitter. And um, they run a, an accessible field trip uh, or they have the last few years for AG or for GSA. Um, and their, their focus, I hope I'm not wrong in saying this, their focus is on um, on people with physical disabilities and increasing access to geosciences. And they also have an email list where people ask questions and it's, a, it's very active. I don't think I've ever seen a question posted there where people didn't have multiple responses to help somebody um, increase access to a course or to information for their students. So Lindsay's had asked, are there any resources you can recommend for finding good diverse geoscientists or SciComm social media accounts for sharing with undergrad students? I live for this question, yes. <laughs> um, it's true. If you follow any of those hashtags that we shared, especially ones that are surrounding things like um, Black and Geoscience or this is what a scientist looks like, that'll take you to people that are kind of tuned in to, to these uh, conversations in these spaces. And so those are good ways to find people. And then once you find one person, you know, they like lead you on to the next. Alternately, I'm happy for you to send me an email or send an AGT an email and I can uh, curate a list for you about, you know, people that I think, and, and it's coming from my perspective, people that I've learned a lot from or that I think are really um, having these important conversations, interesting conversations. I also want to acknowledge um, uh, Riamat, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly. Um, Riamat spoke up about why these JEDI efforts, DEI efforts, are seem to be separate from, from research. And um, I'm not sure if I understood your point correctly, but I think you're saying like, why are these things separate? Why aren't all these things integrated? And absolutely, all these efforts need to be integrated. We need to not just have a separate group off to the side that's working on justice issues. Uh, that's tokenism of an effort, right? So um, what's the, the answer to that to get it truly integrated? I, my answer is we need to hire leadership that values DEI. And that goes back to the question of how do we talk to that department head who doesn't seem to be interested in that issue. Um, again, drawing from the workshop I was in this weekend, the, the workshop leader talked about 20, 60, 20. We also talk about this with conspiracy theories and other things. There are 20% of people who are doing the work who have full buy-in. 60% of the people maybe don't have, feel like they have the time or the knowledge. 20% of the people don't care or aren't into it. And, and where are we gonna prioritize our efforts? We need to prioritize those 60%. But what if the people in power are in those 20%? And that's something that I, I think is tricky. And I, I do think that's where we need to really, as much as we can, whatever is in our power, we need to hire leaders that value justice within geoscience. Yeah, if it, justice and diversity can never be a side project. It has to be integrated in everything we do. Um, uh, Julian had asked, does anyone know if there are similar organizations or resources providing support and access to neurodivergent geoscientist students, people in the audiences? As the, as the mother of a neurodivergent child, I would love to know if anybody has any resources on this. So if you do, please share. And I think the IAGD would be the the closest to that, that's where I would I would start. And again, that list is really helpful. What are you smiling at? Did you uh, Tara had, had posted an answer to that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. uh, first education award. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to first say thank you for hosting this. And also just the dialogue in the chat has been amazing and very helpful. But if anyone does want to keep in touch um, um, with me regarding uh, neurodiverse or neurodivergent people and paleontology, happy to do so it's near and dear to my heart so if you're willing to post your contact information mitchell the when this webinar goes live the chat is not part of the part that goes uh live on the website right right okay so i believe if you're willing tara uh, to put your contact information in there or how people can find you then that will not be made public that'll just be available to the people here today 
Sure, and I just want to say thanks again for hosting this. It's been super helpful. Thank you. Thanks for coming. All right, we're right. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I know Mitchell has some closing slides. We could talk about this all day. Uh, we could talk about this all day. <laughs> so Mitchell, you have to cut us off at some okay, point. Hold on. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let uh, me um, share my screen so Mitchell can oh, sure. do his. Um, well, while you're doing that, a, a huge thank you to you both, Beth and Wendy, for, for today's presentation. Um, really fantastic and informative. I certainly got out of, a lot out of it, um, and it seems like the rest of the group did. Um, thank you all for attending today. We're glad you could join us. Um, our next webinar in the series is the NGSS ESS mini series part one, Remote Teaching and Learning Resources. That's uh, Thursday, September 10. Uh, we hope you can join us. As always, we have an evaluation survey for today's webinar. I just put a link to that in the chat. If you have an extra few minutes, uh, please do fill that out. Let us know what you thought, suggestions for the future, either topics or you know how we run Zoom, that kind of thing. Again, we really appreciate you all joining us. And thank you again, Beth and Wendy. And we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks, everybody. Take good care.